I wasn't able to come back to Sweden. The first time I came here was in 1999. And the reason I was not able to come back, I'm going to speak kind of quickly because I know you all speak English, um, was because my wife said, frankly, you're never going back to Sweden. I said, why? And she said, you know why. And so I met my wife in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And a week after I met her, I had a trip planned with several friends to come to Stockholm to meet up with some girls that we knew. And we spent a very long lost week here in Stockholm, in the middle of winter, camped out in their apartment. And the story continues, I moved back to America with the woman who will soon be my wife. And for months, if not years, little tiny pieces of tinfoil are falling out of my clothes and out of my objects and my belongings and my bag. And as they unravel, they're all little tiny love notes from a girl that I spent the weekend with in Sweden, <laughs> who, had, uh, who was a poet and a very articulate. But uh, face to face, she wasn't able to talk to me and tell me that she loved me. Uh, and this was before text messaging and before uh, you know, heavy use of email. So it was a way of reaching out to a reader <laughs> and expressing herself. And it, it was a very analog way of doing it, but it was a very, it was, in a way, it's kind of like a very early version of physical analog Twitter. And <laughs> on the theme of uh, reaching out to readers, I had a little bit of an epiphany earlier when Tove was talking about book discovery. And we're going to talk a little bit about love and relationships with readers, because publishers should love readers, and readers should love books, and they should love libraries. When Tova was talking about discovery, you always hear discovery talked about in the context of, I'm going to introduce you to the book that you're going to love. Now, I want, to think, I want you to all think about when you did date. How many times when a friend of yours said, I'm going to introduce you to the person you're going to fall in love with? It never worked, did it? No, it was terrible. You met them, it was a disaster, you never got along. But the person you did fall in love with was the person sitting next to them at dinner or their friend. That is book discovery. That's a lot what libraries have to do. It's about that serendipity. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the digital commons, and I'm going to go into some more factual information, and I need to get my laptop. Now, we do have a traditional point of view of libraries. Looks a little bit like this. Shh. Be quiet, right? Now, there is something to be said for this whole idea of be quiet. Uh, earlier this year, there was an American book critic named Laura Miller, who's very famous, and she wrote a very controversial essay uh, in Salon, Salon, which is an online journal. And it said, there's a lot to be said for shushing. Um, I've long believed that the one of the most precious resources libraries can offer their patrons is simple quiet. And I want you to keep that in mind. Because the typical image we have of the library is dated, it's elderly, it's stodgy. Uh, but anybody who's working with libraries and engaging with libraries can tell you that things have changed. They would like to make you think of themselves more like this. <laughs> and that's right. Bet you didn't know that this was going on at your local library. <laughs> For thousands of years, libraries have offered citizens a place to gather and share ideas or simply get lost in the pages of a book. Uh, at the turn of the last century, however, there were those who believed that the internet era, nobody would have the time or inclination to use the library anymore. Now, in our 21st century, we argue that these palaces of literacy and learning would become obsolete. I'm here to talk for about another 15 minutes about this very subject and about what we can do when we're looking at the future of the library. This is a project that the New York Public Library put on last year called Find the Future, which was to inspire their patrons to communicate back to the library and tell them what they were interested in. Now, this two-way communication, previously libraries, it was a one-way street. Publishers would sell to the libraries, and the libraries would communicate to the readers and get the books. But there was never information coming back to the publishers. Now, we all know that the role of the library is changing. The question is, what role? will libraries play in this future? Bookstores are beleaguered. Uh, what role can libraries fill? The crux of this, one could argue, centers around this big fat word that we've all been living with, data. Data is everywhere, and it really is changing the relationships we have with each other. Authors can now track their sales online like they do a stock. 
um, the market is demanding more and more information. Publishers are in turn demanding more information from retailers. Retailers are demanding information from their readers. But for the average reader, the library plays a very important role in mediating all of this data. They live, as we all do, in a world of exploding information. We might think that Google is the answer to everything, but how many of you have been stymied when trying to find a piece of information online? Librarians are information experts. Now, just to give you a sense of the scope of exploding information, there was a professor at the University of Southern California named Martin Hilbert who has tried to quantify everything that has been produced, the amount of information stored and communicated. This includes everything from printed books to tweets to paintings to music and video games. Now, he estimates that in the year 2000, just 25% of the world's information was digital and 75% was non-digital. The world looked a lot like this. By 2007, he'd calculated that there were 300 exabytes of data in the world. One exabyte is equal to one billion gigabytes. By 2013, there were 1,200 exabytes. The amount of digital information had quadrupled in six years. Not only that, just 2% of it was analog and 98% of it was digital. Our world was beginning to look a lot like that. Now, when library users have been surveyed, there are three things that they want more than anything. The obvious one, books. The second one is help. That's the intermediary role that librarians and libraries will play for readers in this world of consuming information. The third of those is technology. But the kicker is everybody wants it for free. Now, all of us in this room who work in a business of publishing may have some questions about how that's going to happen. Um, but when you're looking at the digital commons, you have to look at this question of free. Uh, public libraries are losing financing. They're losing support because of that illu illusion that the digital world, everything is free, everything is immediately accessible. Uh, this is a community question. This is a government question. This is a political question. You can't frame it any other way. But I think if you want to talk about libraries and you want to talk about it in the context of politics and community, you always have to think of libraries as a space. But one of the things when we talk about when we look at the future of libraries, it's not always a physical space you need to conceive of it as a space that's both big and small. Sometimes it's a really big physical space. I live in Texas, and later today you might hear Javier Celaya refer to data as the oil of the world now. And so is it no more appropriate to have somebody who lives in Houston talk about the oil of the world? Uh, the examples I'm going to show you following now is largely drawn from Texas. Uh, this is the McAllen Library in Texas. It's 125 th square feet. It's about five miles from the border with Mexico. And this was built in an old Walmart. Astonishing. Think about an Ikea emptied of all its goods for sale. That's one concept of a library. This is another concept of a library. These are called little free libraries. This is a program that's been spread out all over the world. Thousands of them have been set up, and you set it up on your property or in a public space, and you leave the books that you are willing to loan, and people can take them and leave their own books. It's extremely, extremely successful. Libraries are in the hands of the individual, much in the same way publishing is in the hands of self-publishers. The question of whether a library is physical or digital is also a very important point when you're talking about the commons. Nowadays, not only are libraries physical and digital, they're portable. This is from the South by Southwest conference just, if, just last week in Austin, Texas. These are two different types of libraries. One, each of these is a wireless device. One was set up on a bike, 
And when it became, uh, when you were within a certain distance of the bike, it would connect with your smartphone and allow you to borrow free books, DRM free books. Were you technically borrowing them or just taking them and passing them on? That's again a question of conjecture. The second uh, object there is called a library box. It's actually called a pirate library. And the idea is, is again, it's filled with materials that have uh, no DRM, that are open of encry encryption, and again, are wireless, and within a certain proximity, can be shared and transmitted around uh, the community surrounding them. Many of you might have also heard of a project in San Antonio, Texas, called Bibliotech. Now, Bibliotech is being dubbed as the world's first bookless library. Um, it's a very particular kind of institution because it's going to be set up in a very impoverished neighborhood, uh, largely Hispanic, in San Antonio, Texas, with no books, only screens. They're going to have lendable e-readers, and it's being funded as a private and public enterprise. It's a, it's a fairly daring project, and um, one that a lot of people are going to be looking to see if it succeeds. But one of the most amazing things about Bibliotech is it's really cheap. They're only going to invest about $125,000 in this entire project. And now, mind you, San Antonio is not a small place. It's the seventh or eighth largest city in the United States. Um, when you talk about digital, one of the reasons people wonder is, is this going to be destroying our reading lives? It's important to just look at the fact that the average person nowadays reads about 36,000 words a day. This research is actually a couple years old, and that number is probably higher. It's the equivalent of one-third of a novel a day. It's up 30% from before the internet. When we want to talk about libraries, again, one of the big factors is research. But you can't divorce the idea that publishers can glean a lot of information from libraries without actually looking at who the users are and who the demographics are. Different libraries have different economic and cultural and communal um, dispositions. The National Library has an enormous budget. A tiny library in a small town in the north of Sweden is going to have a tiny budget. With book buyers, book buyers are also library users. Library users are not necessarily book buyers. The opportunities for research from the publishing industry to glean user data, to glean um, information about what people want from their libraries, is giving you a new opportunity. Because you're not necessarily going to get that information from a bookstore, because the non-readers or the non-book buyers are not necessarily going into a bookstore. Libraries offer you access to an audience that you don't already have access to. It's the general population. Certainly, Privacy is an issue, and people will fight some of this data mining, if you will, from libraries. But libraries also offer another opportunity for publishers, and a big key one that we're talking about is marketing. Is it a point of sale for ebooks? Um, one of the big issues, maybe not so in, in Sweden, the ebook lending situation is very, very contentious, as I've learned over the last couple of days. But one of the questions is, is as bookstores erode, are libraries going to be our next point of sale? It's a good question. If a book is not available in a physical form to lend, or there's a limited lending option on the digital book, or, for example, if somebody has borrowed a book and would like to own a copy of that book, is a library a, vi a viable point of sale for books? Absolutely, you would think. Uh, it does certainly offer the opportunity to develop focus groups for reading especially when you have this more individualized and specific type of publishing that we've been talking about all day long. The other thing that book uh, libraries can do is they always offer an opportunity for publishers to educate the public about literacy and reading. It's just an important part of the discussion that doesn't often get talked about in the context of conferences where the focus tends to be on best practices and making money. This is just an uh, example of one promotional scheme that one library in Knoxville, Tennessee, in the United States used to promote their ebooks. And the theme was, where will ebooks take you? The idea that ebooks are going to be a portal into a new, um, a new realm is quite, I think, seductive. Again, I spoke about uh, point of sale, and these are just reiterating those, those concepts. The digital commons is very important, and libraries are ultimately about community. 
they are local. And in the same way that the publishing business is reflecting the individual tastes of readers, whether it's having a book printed on demand to the color and specification that you want, or customizing a children's title with your own daughter's name, uh, libraries are themselves looking at the opportunity to become publishers. They will have access to a local community who will have stories to tell. You are seeing libraries that are putting uh, Espresso book machines on site, for example, enabling their patrons to self-publish on site. Um, they can also educate about self-publishing opportunities. Uh, I think that's a very important role that they can play. Libraries are always political and change agents. Uh, again, you have a very personal one-on-one -on -one relationship. Finally, it can't be overstated that libraries have the opportunity to be, um, or the libraries are always going to be archival. They are our communal memory. Again, please don't think of them only as physical. They are both physical and digital. And you don't have to think of them as entirely as institutions. They are really the society's memory. And you know how our memory is, and it informs our day-to-day -day thinking. That's the conceptual point. As an example, I'm going to use talk about specifically about a project that I uh, have personally been involved in. I'm on the advisory council of the University of Texas in Austin. It's one of the biggest public, uh, public education systems in the United States. And one of the things I helped to do was raise money and establish what's called the Human Rights Digitization Archive. And what we do is we digitize the records of human rights abuses. Uh, on the right, you'll see papers that were attempted to be burned at the Guatemalan Police Archive. Those are records of torture. Um, but what this has done, I want to use this as an example of how you can reach beyond your own community. The projects we've done have covered Rwanda, they've covered Burma, they've covered Honduras. We're probably going to be working soon in Colombia. And the idea is, is to be able to not only digitize these, these resources for education use, but to preserve them. There have been many, many uh, attempts to destroy evidence of these crimes in their physical form. Specifically in Rwanda, the Kigali Memorial Library is often bombed, grenaded, burnt. And so the idea is not only to digitize these, but to share them globally. And essentially the concept is open access research for litigation for the International Criminal Court. You put this up on the web, you preserve it forever, you leave it globally open. Any attorney around the planet can work on this material. I think it's a fairly interesting idea of how a local library can go global, if you will, with the resources and with the correct intent in mind. Now, we're always, always, always talking about first world problems when we talk about libraries and digitization. And I just want us to remember that. I think it takes a little bit of humility when we talk about A, changing the world, B, um, you know, what we're going to do with our, our vast computer resources and our overwhelming amount of information. Just to put it in context, and I'll be quick, in La Laos, one of the poorest countries in the world, they have two library boats. These are boats. And what they do is they carry about 120 um, or about 12,000 books to remote villages. That's the library system in Laos. And the other is just a portrait of a man in Afghanistan reading in a bomb crater, which I think uh, you know, says a lot. The other thing to keep in mind in this context is you, when as an American, my fear is, is that I'm going to come in and sound like I'm preaching, like I know best. In Sweden, as a smaller market, relatively speaking, you have an opportunity to experiment and to apply those experiments to your actual community. It's always about sense of scale. In the States, we tend to have these large corporations, the Googles, the Apples, the Amazons. You know who they are. Um, and the reason they tend to be so big is because they're serving a community of 330 million people. They don't necessarily rule your world. They rule my world. And the fear is that the Americans are going to be treating everybody a little like that. Don't let you get into that kind of thinking. Don't be afraid of these people. <laughs> um, and then finally, what I want to point out is all of the things that I've said to you only matter insofar as it's what I'm saying, but it's not why you do these things. The publishing community and the libraries in general, the biggest question that you always want to answer is, why am I publishing this book? Why should you read it? Libraries help answer the question of why. Please don't forget that. Thank you very much.